We're at the 22nd Croix. I'm Fred Scheich with IFARA, and we're here with Romas Jelazinas from uh, Gilead Sciences, and he has been working on the cure and working with us on getting that information about what they're doing towards a cure. And there's other information you want to give this time, and I'm excited about uh, having the opportunity to receive that information from you. So just begin. That, well, thank, thank you again for having me, Fred. It's our third annual visit with right. each other now. It's always a pleasure for me to visit with you and to uh, speak about you know, developments in this field to your viewers. Um, so yeah, so uh, yesterday we had a, a very important presentation. Uh, it was given actually by one of our close colleagues, James Whitney, who works at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And uh, he basically uh, had a presentation on uh, TLR7 agonists, so toll-like receptor 7 agonists. And I'll, and I'll tell you more about this because it's an exciting area. Mm -hmm. So uh, the toll-like receptor 7 agonist program at Gilead started about 10 years ago. And the mission was to find a replacement for pegylated interferon because we were initially trying to get this uh, strategy uh, out there for, for the treatment of hepatitis C virus infection. Mm -hmm. And so these are basically small molecules, they're little drugs uh, that they basically trigger TLR7 and induce interferon. So, but now we know that we don't need interferon for the treatment of hepatitis C. Mm -hmm. But in that journey, we started to explore these, these small molecule uh, uh, agonists, and we discovered that they had some very important biological activity uh, against uh, hepatitis B virus in chimpanzees and the woodchuck hepatitis virus in woodchuck, so models of hepatitis B. So, so that then translated to a clinical study that's ongoing right now, a phase two clinical study in HBV-infected individuals. And again, along that journey, uh, about 2008, we asked ourselves whether TLR7 agonists could play a role in HIV eradication or cure. Mm -hmm. And we discovered in, in early lab experiments that uh, those small molecules were able to activate uh, virus from patient cells as well as monkey cells. Mm -hmm. So we basically had, you know, continued to develop that story, continued to study the molecules, found that they had other good attributes. They activated cells like CD8 cells and NK cells, whose business is to kill virally infected cells. So, so we said, hey, maybe we have a kick and kill here, right? We can maybe flush out some virus, and maybe that small molecule will also enhance the immune system to kill those cells. So we said, oh, this is a, a good hypothesis to test. So, uh, so we engaged in this collaboration with Dr. Whitney, and uh, we basically uh, got a, a group of monkeys. We infected them with uh, SIV, the, uh, the cousin, uh, the, mm -hmm. the HIV cousin in monkeys. And we basically uh, then suppressed them with antiretroviral therapy to mimic the situation of patients. And then we gave them a series of, of doses of this TLR7 agonist uh, every two weeks. And it was really interesting. The data were really fascinating. Uh, the first three, three doses didn't do anything, but when we hit dose four, five, six, and seven, we saw these really s substantial plasma viral blips. And right that, you know, you know the field as well as I do, right? It's been difficult to find an agent that translates from the lab that induces this latent HIV to an in vivo setting. So this, I think, is our first example of a really robust induction of virus in well art suppressed animals. Why, so, why would there be such a, do you have any idea why it would be such a, a, a slow to come to a, a benefit? Well, that's the scientist in you, Fred, talking. That's a, that's a great question. We actually don't know. It's a mystery at this point. But it, well, there's nothing, and then yeah. it was something. Exactly. It was a lot. Exactly. Yeah. So there's some form of uh, perhaps preparation of the immune system to eventually release this virus from wherever the, the reservoir is. We don't know where that is yet in these monkeys. But clearly there was some sort of a preparation or, or initial doses were necessary to prepare this release of the virus. So it's a great mystery at this point. We have to figure it out, but that's a, a terrific question. Why uh, some form of a priming event was necessary, don't know. Uh, but these blips were substantial. They were transient, exactly what we're looking for, right? Release of virus, but the immune system is able to contain this virus. So I think we've, we've identified a compound that could be of, of great importance to, to our field. Um, now, uh, when we looked at the viral DNA in those monkeys, uh, the animals that were dosed with the TLR7 agonist had lower viral DNA in their lymphatic tissue. Again, a positive sign. You, you, you hope that you're reducing the reservoir. And then when we uh, released the antiretroviral therapy from those animals, we didn't cure them. They all rebounded. So we didn't cure them. But the viral load set point was lower in the drug-treated animals. So again, a positive sign. We must have done something in the positive direction. So, so plasma viral blips, 
a reduction of viral DNA in the lower viral load set point with this one uh, drug-like molecule after seven doses. So, so very positive uh, sign here. And this is something that, uh, do, do you, does your mind always tell you that maybe this was something else? You know, always some other component might, I mean, obviously once you get it to the point where it does what it needs to do, it, it brings the virus out, it does what it needs to do. Uh, it then goes to war, it does the, 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 the job, and then maybe something else will even make it, enhance it even more. That's a great question as well, exactly. Uh, I think what we've discovered here is we have an agent that seems to flush out or expose cells that, have, that harbor latent HIV, but the data that I just told you about, the plasma rebound was not affected and we certainly didn't cure anything. So you're right, this begs the qu your question is very good. What can we combine this agent now that might help kill those cells that become exposed, right, that are now visible either uh, through a therapeutic vaccination, maybe enhance the immune system, or through other strategies, perhaps monoclonal antibodies, right? These broadly neutralizing mm -hmm. antibodies that are so hot in our field right now. Mm -hmm. So this, is, uh, this was presented when was this? On, this is uh, yesterday. yesterday, yesterday morning, Wednesday. yeah, okay. Wednesday. Great, I, I mean, it's a three ring circus here, so you've got to pick and choose where you go and what you're doing. And, um, one of the things I, I wanted to ask you is the, the work you're doing in CURE uh, or towards a cure, I have to keep making sure that I use the words properly right, there, right. Um, is significant. And you share the data or the, at conferences and so forth. Uh, is there anyone that you're working with currently that will, um, in a collaborative way, that specifically you're working as partners? I know there's collaborators and there's partners on certain things. Can you share that with us? Or? Yeah, we have, uh, and I think we've spoke about, spoken about this in, in past years, you know, we have uh, very nice partnerships with a variety of groups. Uh, the one that I'm very excited about that we just announced uh, this past year is a collaboration between uh, Dan Baruch, an investigator, again, at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, uh, and the Gates Foundation. So mm -hmm. we have come together, uh, the Gates Foundation has, has given Dan a, a grant, a substantial grant, to study one of these broadly neutralizing antibodies. It's called PGT-121. And in, in, in work that Dan did in his animal model system showed that it had you know, pretty profound biological activity, was able to suppress a uh, virus uh, by multiple logs. So, mm -hmm. so we decided together uh, to, to work together and to basically uh, do more work to understand how this antibody you know, could be optimally used with other agents in monkeys. But more importantly, uh, the Gates Foundation grant enables Dan to make GMP grade uh, antibody PGT-121 so he can test this in humans, so he can do a clinical study. So that's where we really need to go and we need to go there quickly. So this is a great opportunity where a philanthropy, uh, a, a great academic group and a biotech company basically are coming together to try to uh, advance a concept that we uh, saw in monkeys, the reduction of a viral, uh, a virus in monkeys, and to see if this translates to the clinic now. So, so that's a really terrific, unique collaboration. Uh, that we're very enthusiastic about. One of the things that I, I wanted to do this conference that I, I was saying that I thought I got everything handled, but uh, we did want to put a face on the FDA and they refused to, not uh, uh, arbitrarily, they were thoughtfully refused to not come forward with, uh, with a, a discussion to the public, you know, that I would put it out on the air. And they did have closed meetings with some of the community activists who were trying to figure out the process, the regulatory process to you know, to the work you're doing. And uh, do you find it easy to work with them or, or is it, is any of that come up yet because you're not really, you know, you at some point you have to discuss with them the pathway. Yeah, I mean, we, we have a long history of working with the FDA, of course, being at Gilead, we've developed many small molecules uh, and anti HIV antivirals have a long history of being, uh, having a partnership with the FDA. So, uh, yes, the work for us has been always uh, straightforward mm -hmm. with them. I just don't know what they're, I don't know if there's a real plan because, you know, I guess you're going to have to come to them and say, this is what we you know, believe is the, the way you can answer this question. Is this something is this the right way as far as you're concerned? Well, this is a very good question again, Fred. I mean, I think where we're at at this point is to, is to initially uh, test some concepts here that are emerging from the animal model. So for example, the TLR7 concept, TLR7 agonist concept that I told you about earlier, the first order of business is to, is to bring this molecule, or a, a close analog of this molecule that we're testing in HPV-infect individuals, mm -hmm. 
bring it to the clinic and ask, are we going to see the same type of blipping that we saw in the monkey, right? That is the highest yeah. importance. So again, you know, the FDA has been our partners on this. They have reviewed the package and we have uh, an IND that has been uh, approved. And so we're able to, you, to do some uh, testing in, in humans of this TR7 agonist. So uh, these are early days. Your question, I think, is also going toward licensure. That's a whole, mm -hmm. that's a bigger question. I think it's a little early to speak about that right now. Right now, we just need to ensure that the concepts that we are seeing in animals and maybe some in vitro actually have value in, in the mm -hmm. clinic. And, and, and once we have those signals, perhaps we will combine those agents and then hopefully drive towards uh, uh, sustained viral remission. Let's call it that for now. And, and then the FDA will be, again be a key partner. So when you talk about the, um, the, the killing of the, the, the particles after you've brought them out, the viral particles, what, uh, this seems to be a process that, that is, is this already determined by the, uh, the FDA how this is going to be produced in a way that they can regulate it in a way that's safe and so forth. I mean, you're both work, we're all working towards the same goal, safe yes. and, and, uh, and, and answering the question at the same time. But I'm mostly concerned with that there is this um, ongoing relationship that kind of is not going to put you up against the wall at some point because they want you to test this or that. I've often asked them, uh, not just them, but just other companies about the possibility of working with two agents at the same time. and. I think that becomes problematic because you have to prove some individual benefit first, somehow or another. But it may be necessary that, like, to get that ultimate real benefit, that two agents need two agents or actions need to be in place before you can get the benefit on the uh, the killing of it. Or maybe not so much bringing it out of the cells. Hmm. Is that, is that a, a theori yeah. theoretical? Uh, model that might make sense. Absolutely. I think that's exactly where we're going to end up because this is a very new area for us, this, this eradication research and all these agents that we're moving forward, the vast majority are not FDA approved, so mm -hmm. we need to figure them out, see how they work together. The key is, I think, to understand them individually, at least get First. some preliminary data, yeah. understand that they are achieving what we hope for them to achieve. Uh, so, for example, the TR7 agonist I spoke about, we want to see a viral blip Safe, and it has to be safe, of course. We have mm -hmm. to see a viral blip, it has to be safe. Uh, the antibodies are, uh, there's a different path for them. These are fundamentally antivirals, right? These antibodies are mm -hmm. broadly neutralizing, which means they uh, can attach to virions and block their entry into infected cells. So you can do a preliminary experiment in HIV untreated individuals and show that you can reduce the viral load in those patients a as a measure of efficacy. Now that's going to, what we're asking the antibody to do in the context of eradication is a bit different, but to at least get a measure of its safety and efficacy is, is very important. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a path, a, a path, a stepwise path to ensure that each of the agents are doing what they're supposed to be doing and eventually, as you said, combine them and then have that dialogue with the FDA. So, And maybe we just ask you a little bit of, uh, to speak to the issue of the importance of the, the subjects that are going into the trials. And ultimate safety, as you said earlier, uh, is always of high, high concern. But the importance of that participation in the trials, because this is something that is altruistic, it's likely that some of this is not going to be, provide an immediate effect or benefit to the patient. We certainly put that in the informed consent. But the most important thing is that we do have participants in these trials, because they are um, they're the, the body of what, where we get the answers. You're absolutely right. Um, this, this is key. Uh, as you said, the most important thing, paramount thing is safety. So when we advance these agents forward, we want to make sure that they're safe. Mm -hmm. Again, we want to get a signal of, of efficacy from them. But you're right, the participation of these subjects is key to, to be able to, to advance and understand whether we're on the right path. In early days, we want to know if the path is correct, right? These are early days. Uh, this is not like developing uh, a third generation antiretroviral where we have decades of research that precede it. We know exactly how to do those types of studies. And you're comparing this is one agent with a better agent. Uh, exactly. Better. exactly. Here's, is uh, comparing against nothing. A new field. Yeah. We don't even know what it takes to eradicate HIV. We're going to try to figure this out. But you're right, these early studies are aimed to tell us, are we on the right path? 
And, and that is the difficult question of are we reducing these persistent reservoirs? And you know the, this field very well. There are not great assays right now that are translatable to the clinic that tells us that we are able to reduce reservoirs. So we have many challenges. We're bringing concepts forward, therapeutic concepts forward, but we're not 100% sure of how to uh, determine whether they're efficacious or not. Mm -hmm. uh, are you working with uh, any companies and labs or so on, on developing and certifying assays? And well, yeah. In fact, that's one, uh, another one of our, our really nice collaborations. We, uh, we are basically working with uh, Monogram, uh, mm -hmm. a company that has been well known for resistance testing. And we uh, collaborated with them to, uh, to transfer an assay that measures, uh, to a certain extent, uh, viral reservoir. Now, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't measure the uh, direct in vivo reservoir, but it, it, you have the ability with this assay to, at baseline, take, take some cells from a subject and measure ex vivo, or in vitro, how much virus can be activated from that patient's cells. Then you do the intervention, and then you repeat the assay and ask, have I reduced this reservoir? And it's basically an ex vivo inducible reservoir. So mm -hmm. again, trying to chip away, trying to develop the tools that we need mm -hmm. to measure reservoir. So this is a collaboration with Monogram, very nice collaboration. And they're in fact applying this assay to the ACTG study that I spoke to you in past years, this, the Romadepsin trial that I told you about, A5315, uh, which is led by the ACTG. So we basically worked with Monogram to develop that assay so it can be applied for the first time clinically to the ACTG trial. So, and so are there any other, um, uh, are there any programs that you're doing that are, that are worthy of uh, prime time? putting it out to the audience. Well, the, the TLR7 that I told you about, we're very excited yeah. about that. Uh, and uh, we're actually uh, preparing a, a clinical study. As I said, I think that's going to be a, a very important uh, milestone, the question of whether the TLR7 agonist activates virus in patients. That is a very important milestone. Uh, so we're very excited about that. Um, the other thing that we're excited about is something that we announced uh, last summer. So I told you about that nice collaboration between the Gates Foundation, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Baruch, and Gilead. But what we also did is we um, obtained an exclusive license to that antibody, PGT-121, and other antibodies from a company called Theraclone, which is a, the company that basically identified with Dennis Burton and Iavi, identified those, those antibodies. So we have an exclusive license, so our job now is to see if we can develop them for human use. So we're, we're excited about those two fronts, TLR7 and broadly neutralizing antibodies with uh, an enhanced effector function, which means it, it, we want to make them better killers of virally infected cells, essentially. So. Seems like you've covered it. I, I, I'm really appreciative of you taking the time and, and uh, covering the, the, the pieces of what seems to be breaking news. And uh, at least you're breaking it to us. You had the news earlier. But, uh, but I, I appreciate you also working with uh, Monogram Biosciences. I worked with them as a liaison for ATAC for a number of years. And uh, they're now through uh, LabCorp, I guess, as a, their major mm -hmm. corporation is back then. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for your time. It's, Always it's a, pleasure. a pleasure. Always Spending a pleasure to visit with you, friend. Yeah. Thank you.